Good evening. We are so happy to be back here learning with you again for the third and final session of the Poetry of Jewish Memory with Mr. Daniel Kraft. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to extend a hearty muscle tov and kol chakavod to Mr. Kraft for recently uh, being named a fellow of the Yiddish Book Center. And uh, he will hopefully share with us uh, who and what he will be working on translating in his uh, latest achievement um, with the Yiddish Book Center. Without further ado, Mr. Kraft, please. Awesome. Thank you, as always, uh, for that introduction and um, for this opportunity. And thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. It's great to see familiar names and new names, and i um, really excited about this. Um, and you mentioned this uh, Yiddish, translation, Yiddish Book Center Translation Fellowship that I just received. So I'll just say briefly a word about that. I'm very excited about that. So I, I received this fellowship from the Yiddish Book Center. In a lot of ways, it's very much aligned with everything that we've been talking about and exploring over the past few weeks in these sessions, um, because my fellowship project is to translate the work of a Yiddish writer, mostly a poet uh, named Itcha Slutsky, who's almost entirely been forgotten, unfortunately. Uh, he wrote one book, uh, it was published in Warsaw in 1939, which if you know anything about Jewish history, you know, is not the most auspicious time to be publishing a debut poetry collection. Um, and he, uh, he became very involved in um, resistance to the Nazi occupation of his hometown in Belarus and died um, while fighting as a partisan in Belarus outside, outside of Minsk. So I'm really excited to be bringing his, um, his work and his life um, you know, to, a, to an audience and um, you know, sharing his remarkable writing uh, so you can Stay tuned with me one way or another for more information about that uh, soon. But um, for now, let's go ahead and get into our topic for this evening. So can everyone see my screen share okay? Yep. Perfect, perfect. So this is the third and final uh, meeting of this series on the poetry of Jewish memory. Just to recap briefly, our first session coincided with uh, Yom HaShoah. We explored poems that um, gave their perspectives on Jewish memory of the Holocaust. Um, last week, our second session coincided with uh, this sort of transition moment, Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzma'ut, right? Israeli uh, Memorial Day and Israeli Independence Day, and we explore some of that in poetry, both explicitly and more more implicitly. Tonight we'll be thinking a little bit more broadly about Jewish memory, about uh, especially about sort of midrashic memory and how we what we remember from biblical texts that we read and that we consider in some way a part of our collective memory, and also a little bit about um, Jewish identity, contemporary Jewish identity, and how memory relates to that. Um, but if you're tuning in for the first time, what we've been doing is starting each session with a, a text that's not a poem, but that sort of frames some ideas and questions and concerns about Jewish memory. And I wanted to do that again tonight, this time with a Hasidic tale, which, um, which Gershom Sholem, the great scholar of Jewish mysticism published. Um, and he attributed this, he said that he heard this from Shai Agnon, the great Hebrew writer, Israel's uh, only Nobel Prize laureate in literature. So we'll look at this tale and um, we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll start by thinking a little bit about what it says about how Jewish memory works. Maybe some people have come across this already, um, but the story goes, so, and the, in, you know, it begins mentioning the Baal Shem Tov. So the Baal Shem Tov was the uh, rabbi who was the founder of Hasidic Judaism. And so this kind of populist, mystical master in the 18th century in what's now Ukraine. So the story goes, when the Baal Shem Tov had a difficult task before him, he would go to a certain place in the woods, light a fire and meditate in prayer. 
and what he had set out to perform was done. When a generation later, the Maggid of Mezrich, the Baal Shem Tov's successor in the Hasidic movement, was faced with the same task, he would go to the same place in the, in the woods and say, we can no longer light the fire, but we can still speak the prayers. And what he wanted done became reality. Again, a generation later, Rabbi Moshe Lieb of Sasov had to perform this task. And he too went into the woods and said, we can no longer light a fire, nor do we know the secret meditations belonging to the prayer, but we do know the place in the woods to which it all belongs. And that must be sufficient and sufficient it was. But when another generation had passed and Rabbi Israel of Rizhin was called upon to perform the task, he sat down on his chair and said, we cannot light the fire. We cannot speak the prayers. We do not know the place, but we can tell the story of how it was done. And the story which he told had the same effect as the actions of the other three. Any general thoughts, questions, responses to this um, before we think a little more specifically? Um, and, and as was mentioned in the introduction, I just want to reiterate, please feel free to participate. This is the more voices that we have uh, in these conversations, the better. So I would really love for this to be, um, to be a conversation. Don't be shy. The thing that really jumped out from this to me um, was mostly Passover, but we very much like we love having <laughs> role play and reenactment in our rituals. Um, you know, also like the temple service for Yom Kippur, that's another one where uh, even just reading it is meant to be as if we are doing it, even though I'm not the Kohen Gadol, but it's still, you know, it still counts for me to be reading that during services on Yom Kippur. And, uh, you know, Passover in particular, as we tell the story, it's not this happened, you know, uh, to other people a long, long time ago. It's this happened to me. I was a slave in the time. So the idea of a story being as sufficient as, you know, the highest level of action feels, again, you know, I keep saying this, but very Jewish, <laughs> very Jewish, it's a very Jewish way of looking at things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for starting that off. Um, what are any other general thoughts, responses, questions after reading this? Um, are we supposed to think that um, um, the generation after it had the same effect? Or maybe it just stopped at that generation uh, with Rabbi Israel? I think this is a great question, right? So I can imagine a couple different ways of looking at it. One is, I think we could extrapolate this even further and say, at an hour telling the story of this, storytelling had the same effect. I don't know that, that I really endorse that, but I do think that we're meant to see this as something that continues. Um, and I'll tell you that what, what Gershom Sholem says, comments on this, is that you know we can learn from this that even if we forget how things were once done, by remembering what we do know about them, we can tap. We can always tap into um, their content. That, that's something that never ends. Through even when we forget, through clinging to the few things we can remember, we're always able to access something of of what was lost. But yeah, it's a good. That's a really good question. I'm seeing some other uh, some uh, chat things uh, and some hands being raised. And I'm not very tech savvy. So um, thanks everybody for your patience with that. But um, yeah, um, Michael, did you have something that you wanted to add? Yes, I do. Great. So the question you really raise is person A, somehow or other had a sense they made contact with God. And other people want to do the same. And so, but they only know what they know and so on. And so the question is, what does the other person do? And so this question passed down like dominoes. And what it really uh, suggests 
is that this is the question of the world. And so it, it, it cannot be the case that we have to repeat what the Baal Shem Tov did. He just showed it was possible. Okay, now it so happens that last week I heard a, uh, a, a life summary by Aaron Marcus in Berkeley. And um, so at the end, we wound up having a conversation uh, uh, about artificial intelligence. And so, and so there were issues that, that came up. I think it's in Hosea, it says, God telleth man what is his thought. Now you could interpret that by saying, uh, the prophet says that God tells him what we're supposed to know. And so uh, the prophet is the intermediary. But you could also interpret it to mean God tells man what man's thought is. Now, this has significance because what if it means that based on your actions and your thoughts and your uh, whatever, and what you've done in the past, you get the thoughts that you get. In other words, the only the reason you have consciousness is because you're getting it from God. God is the only source of consciousness in the universe. And so what we're saying is you're always in contact with God, but you may or may not like the contact you have. That's about yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's very present here. This idea that, you know, there's this kind of originating consciousness and we might lose a thread of it, but it doesn't mean we've actually lost the thread. We might just have lost our sense of awareness of it. I think that that goes or into- our satisfaction with it. Or our satisfaction with it, absolutely. I think that goes into sort of how I want to think about this in terms of a framing for the poetry of Jewish memory. Um, there's a lot that we could say about it. It's an extraordinarily rich little story. Uh, but what I want to suggest, or what, what I take from it that I think is relevant to our topic is really two things. One is that we do forget a lot. We forget a lot as people. We forget a lot as Jews. We lose a lot in the process of the transmission of our religious traditions and ideas and practices, right? The Baal Shem Tov knew how to do something. And just one generation later, people had forgotten how to do that. Maybe they never knew. I don't know exactly. But there's something lost in the course of transmission. So that's one thing. Forgetting is real. It happens. And at the same time, what I take from this is that forgetting is not as real as it might seem. So the few things that we do remember, even if they seem inadequate, even if they seem insufficient, even if they seem wholly removed from what once was, can actually be sufficient to um, re-enter what once was. And we can do that specifically through the act of retelling. So remembering, communally remembering things doesn't just talk about them and actually enacts them in some ways, even if what's remembered is otherwise lost. That's sort of what I take away from this. And so I think we can think about that in terms of poetry as well, right? A poetry about things that are lost in some way brings them back, keeps them alive, just as telling about what was lost in this story keeps what was lost alive. So I just wanted to sort of offer that as a framing for our final session this evening. Yeah, El, did you wanna add something? I do wanna add something. I came mm -hmm. on a few minutes late. I don't know if it was said or not, but I think that this is very apropos on the heels of Yom HaShoah as we're losing survivors and we're losing, you know, um, first account experiences but we're going to, you know, future generations will then have to tap into those memories, even if we lose a lot. Totally. And that was not already said. And I think it is apropos, right? Just by, and by retelling this, what, what this Hasidic tale offers us, by retelling, we actually can reclaim what we think we've lost in some ways and tap into 
that original thing that seems to be gone. Uh, so just a quick reminder, we'll move on. Um, so our animating question, right? What argument is each poem we look at making about the nature and experience of Jewish memory? We'll come back to that through the course of this evening. And uh, I mentioned we'll be looking at some, uh, some, more midra some midrashic poetry this evening, thinking about what we remember and what we forget from biblical stories. And I have a bunch of Yehuda Amichai poems this evening as well, because he was so rich to talk about last week, so I'm excited to return to him. And that does remind me, a few of you uh, reached out to me via email after last week's session. I had a really hectic week. I wasn't able to get to those emails, but thank you for those notes. Please feel free to continue if anyone has more thoughts, and I will respond to you soon. So uh, thanks for reaching out. But this poem is called uh, The Real Hero. Hebrew is Hagibor uh, Ha'amiti, if you're a Hebrew speaker, by Yehuda Amichai. And it gets directly at what we remember and what we sort of allied from these biblical narratives. So I'm going to go ahead and read this, and then we'll discuss it with this question in mind about what, what Jewish memory is and how it works. So the real hero. The real hero of the binding of Isaac was the ram, who didn't know about the collusion between the others. He was volunteered to die instead of Isaac. I want to sing a memorial song about him, about his curly wool and his human eyes, about the horns that were so silent on his living head and how they made those horns into shofars when he was slaughtered to sound their battle cries or to blare out their obscene joy. I want to remember the last frame like a photo in an elegant fashion magazine. The young man tanned and pampered in his jazzy suit and beside him the angel, dressed for a formal reception, a long silk gown, both of them looking with empty eyes at two empty places. And behind them, like a colored backdrop, the ram caught in the thicket before the slaughter, the thicket, his last friend. The angel went home. Isaac went home. Abraham and God had gone long before, but the real hero of the binding of Isaac is the ram. So I always find this poem very moving. There's something about this detail of, I wanna sing a memorial song about him, about his curly wool and his human eyes. That, that really touches me, but it's also really an interesting framing of a poem, right? I want to sing a memorial song about him. It seems to me that Amichai is saying, I want to be able to memorialize him. And yet, I'm not sure that I can, right? He doesn't say this is a memorial song. He says, I want to sing a memorial song. And that seems to me a very significant difference here. But I'm curious what other responses people have to this poem, if anybody wants to share anything that's coming to mind right now. Yeah, yeah, Elle. Um, I kind of find it a little bit irreverent. Great, yeah. You know, like it's a very serious moment in the Bible and it's a very um, intense experience and He's talking about the, the ram and talking about the joy being obscene. So there's like an underlying element here of, um, I, I'm not exactly sure. And I don't know what the right word is. I'm going to just go with the reverence. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. Yeah, it's a very irreverent poem. I think he's quite deliberately and explicitly trying to subvert both the text of Breshit and the way we as Jews generally think about that text, generally remember this narrative. I'm trying to introduce a different aspect, a different character, trying to reframe it for us and change the ways that we remember it. I kind of um, think of this as a genre of like, um, I don't know, people writing people rewriting biblical stories into in order to highlight minor characters. And there are all kinds of examples of that genre, but here the minor character is the ram itself. But yeah, Yael, thank you for adding that. I mean, I should have I should have been more explicit in prefacing it that way, that this is a very irreverent 
way of remembering this story. I feel like Christians would probably love this poem. That's my big thought on this one. Can you say more? Well, I, I know that Jesus is typically the sacrificial lamb, which is different mm -hmm. from the sacrificial ram, but the story doesn't work without a substitute of some sort. And in our story, in our tradition, it is the ram. And that's, you know, that's the poor creature's fate. That's just it. That's, you know, that's his destiny. Uh, he winds up on that altar. Um, and in the Christian tradition, uh, no ram in sight. It's just Jesus. Just the son being, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so this is, it's it's really complicated, really subversive and irreverent here, how he's trying to change the way we remember this story um, as Jews. Um, yeah, dad. Um, a couple of things. First of all, um, Henry asked a question I wanted to ask, but he asked it first. So I want to give him credit um, about the two um, the, the two people or the two empty places that the angel is looking at. Um, I don't want to get into the whole Christian thing. But um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is the, um, the adjective obscene. The joy is obscene. Is the joy obs obscene? Because I think it's because it required the sacrifice of the ram, right? The shofar blowing required the ram to give its life for that noise. So in some sense, as a di another kind of subversion, not of the story itself, but of the idea of what the shofar is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, this irreverence thing, we talked about this a little bit last week, but, you know, I'm Michai was raised in a very traditional Orthodox home, and he became, after making Aliyah, as many people of his generation did, um, pretty secular, but always with this sort of sense of humor and irony and playfulness, so that it's really hard to understand what he actually believes from his poems, I think. Um, one, of his, one of his sons did become a, a Baal Teshuva. Um, that's a whole separate story. Um, but anyway, um, but yeah, does anyone have a read here on this stanza? These both of them looking with empty eyes at two empty places. Does anyone have a read? You think on what that is referring to? In my, my initial read of it, the empty places were God and Abraham no longer being present. But I don't see how it all fits in. Yeah, I, I'll be honest that. This stanza, the central part of the poem, is a little bit obscure to me. I think if I were, if I if I can be irreverent, I think it would, it would, as I read it, be a stronger poem without this. But I don't think I have any right to say that. But I said it anyway. Um, but um, but yeah. With that being said, uh, it's not so. It's not totally clear to me. Um, Judith, did you want to did you want to add something? I saw your you had unmuted earlier. I, I, I was also going to raise the issue of the empty places, but uh, I think I think Jim hit it right that when when he says Abraham and God had gone long before, that's when it connected to the empty places. So because at this point, what's left is. Isaac and the angel um, and it kind of retells the whole story right I mean the, the central figures in a sense leave the scene and uh, the non-central ones come forward um, and the ram of course is like in most paintings of the scene the, the ram is somewhere in the corner barely peeking out and now he's become the central you know persona of this whole poem um so there's a whole reversal here of importance and who the heroes are and who we should look up to in a sense yeah yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we go back to this question then of what argument is this making about Jewish memory? I'm inclined to answer that question by saying that Amichai wants us to expand our Jewish memories so that they include these peripheral figures, these peripheral figures who might suffer for the sake of the figures who are not peripheral. And I agree that it's very irreverent. Um, and I also think that's wh whether or not he's like fully endorsing a revisionist take on on Breshit, on Genesis, which I don't think he, he really is. I think it's just, I read it as a sort of rhetorical strategy trying to get us to broaden our sort of ethical or empathetic imaginations about these stories. One reason I think that is that he says, I want to remember, and I mentioned this earlier, but I want to remember is a very different kind of rhetorical stance than you must remember or something like that. It makes me feel like he's groping for this memory that he can't actually fully enter into, but he thinks it's worth at least reaching for in some way. May I speak? Uh, yeah, who said that? I, I don't see a name here. Michael spoke. Yeah, go for it. So it seems like the, uh, the obscene uh, word refers to the idea of deriving pleasure, satisfaction, joy from the suffering and in the, the destruction of something else. Uh, but what I wanted to say is uh, God says to Israel, you are my sheep. And in some sense, at least what I experienced is that everyone has been volunteered by being born. And so it's like the whole Jewish people is bound as Isaac and has been sacrificed to the needs, God's needs through history that will be revealed when we understand the basis for the Torah. Uh, yeah, yeah, beautiful. I like the way that you are sort of I making- I believe that's just a conjecture that I just said. Yeah, no, but I like the way that you're making all of us sort of complicit in this and extending that sort of what I called his sort of empathetic imagination even further. And as we've talked about with Amichai, often he's very hard to pin down. So this obscene joy, I think he meant that for the moment of this poem. I don't think he meant that holistically about shofars. Um, but anyway, let's, let's move on. I wanna look at one more poem. We're not gonna talk about this one except very, very briefly if someone has something very pressing to say. Um, that I think falls into this category of asking us to expand our ethical remembrance of stories from Tanakh. This is called Letter to Noah. It's by Stanley Moss. Moss is a wonderful, wonderful poet. He's, uh, I think he's 97 years old. He published a new collection uh, a couple years ago, like two years ago, called Almost Complete Poems. Um, so that was sort of his wry acknowledgement that he's end, reaching the end of his career. So this is another sort of midrashic poem that is in some ways irreverent, although I think less so, um, asking us to expand our memory of this story from Tanakh in a newly compassionate way. So there's a letter to Noah. Um, <laughs> Greetings. I hope you will not be disappointed. I survived the flood riding the back of a giant turtle. I love the opening of this poem. Uh, sorry, I, I'm interrupting the poem, which I shouldn't do. But it, to me, it's just such a daring kind of way. Like, we're right in the middle of it. And it sets up this immediately kind of absurd situation that tells us exactly who is talking here, right? Some survivor of the flood we didn't know about. And how did he survive? He wrote the back of a giant turtle, okay? So it's funny, but we're gonna see that it doesn't stay funny. So anyway, greetings. I hope you will not be disappointed. I survived the flood riding the back of a giant turtle. Adrift in the waters of chaos above the ice covered mountain ranges that had become part of the deep, I saw the sun and moon embrace in terror. I kept my senses counting the days that had no name. I heard all manner of newborn things crying for their mothers, nearly the last living sounds. 
We swam through islands of angry faces, an ocean of rodents devouring each other, great serpents of children knotted together in whirlpools. I saw the beauty of jungle birds that in mid-afternoon filled the horizon like a sunset. Once, I saw your vainglorious arc, three stories of lights, your windows filled with riches, a woman on the deck, her wet blouse clinging to her breasts. I was that close. If you had heard my call, saw me alive, would you have reached down to save me? It wouldn't have been the end of the world. But you, of course, were following orders, a tune as old as Adam's song to Eve was for the serpent. Then after all the days of nights, I heard my turtle gasp, hallelujah. I turned and saw the rainbow, the raven and the dove, in sunlight the waters that reflected nothing receding. Noah, I think I am as grateful for the rainbow as you. I have survived, corrupt and unclean. Kind of a weird, intense little poem, right? Again, I don't want to talk too much about this, um, but yeah, oh, yeah. What did you want to? What did you want to say in response to this? The, I think it's kind of amazing. Yeah, I think it's kind of a fabulous poem, and it's um, there's something about remembering something that the text really doesn't focus on. And I guess this the idea of we don't only remember what was, but we also remember like it didn't happen, or maybe it did. You know, things that we don't know about. And I think it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I think that's exactly. I couldn't have said better myself what I was trying to communicate with this poem. Um, but yeah, it's an incredible act of sort of asking us to revise our memories, to include things that if we think about like the shot of the text, the simple narrative actually couldn't have happened, couldn't possibly have happened. And yet there's a space for them here too in this poetry. Not just a space, but a necessary space, I think. Uh, yeah, it's a remarkable, strange poem. Um, Chaya wrote, you know, that ending. Yeah, that ending gets me every time. I think it's phenomenal. He really sticks the landing there. Um, Robin, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just find the phrase great serpents of children jumped out at me and bothered me because I feel like serpent has such negative connotations. You don't usually pair that with children. I agree. Yeah, it's a horrifying image, isn't it? Great serpents of children knotted together in whirlpools. Right, I read this as an image of these, the you know, the myriad drowned people that this flood killed and, and it's it's horrifying and i think what moss is asking us to do in this poem and he's a lot of remarkable jewish poems um he also was was one of the first publishers in america of yehuda amichai in translation he runs a small press um but anyway i think what he's asking us to do is not to to not look away from the horrors that the flood entails if we take this narrative in Tanakh seriously, whether or not it's necessary, he's asking us to really not, not shy away from how kind of morally catastrophic it is, right? An ocean of rodents devouring each other. It's a horrifying image. Yeah. Judith, well, were just... you gonna say something? So. Uh, someone else also put up a sign. Let's talk about the ending. Yes. Um, because he survived, of course, corrupt and unclean. This entire horror was created by God to clean and to deal with corruption and to clean the earth. But he survived against all odds. And therefore, this corruption and uncleanliness survived in spite of God's total destructive effort. Yeah, there is there's a kind of uh, maybe explanation as to the evil continues in the world in spite of all efforts against it. 
Yeah, yeah, well said. And, you know, I would say, right, thinking about our topic of memory and what the stakes are of memory. For me, what this last line gets at, just like you're saying, Judith, is the ways that the ways that how we change what we remember, that's never confined to the past. If I change how I remember something from the past, that has ramifications all the way into the future. And I think we see that very clearly here. If we change how we understand this flood narrative, then the consequences of that don't end with the flood narrative from Tanakh, right? It, it has ripple effects right up until today. Okay. Can I say yeah. something? Yeah. There's, I just, I've, I've read this poem before, but for the first time, I don't think this is a stretch. There's, there's sort of like, um, it's this, there's this weird Holocaust reference in it. I think when he says, first of all, would you have reached down to save me? Which is always the question, right? And then, but of course you were following orders, which it, it's, it's, it's talking about, you said it's not as irre irreverent, but in some sense, it's more irreverent because it's saying it's, you know, it's saying this flood, which is, you, I was pointed out was created by God, is sort of analogous to a type of Holocaust. You were following orders, Noah. Yeah, right? I think that's here. And, I think that's in the text. Yeah. And of course, that's the big criti rabbinic criticism of Noah that he didn't argue with God like Abraham did. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the interesting things about this poem is that it's playing implicitly on a whole Midrashic tradition that asks questions about Noah, right? The, the, the Tanakh says Noah was, you know, a righteous man in his generation. And there's a lot of rabbinic discussion about what that means. Is it is it good to be a righteous man in his generation? Is that like really exceptional? Or is it actually way of denigrating him? He's righteous, well, just compared to his generation. Some people here have probably come across some of these these discussions in rabbinic literature here before. And so I think this poem is, um, is really building off of that and, and making an incredible, strange work of art. I also think a little bit of an aside, but just from the perspective of poetic craft here, something that Moss is a master of is knowing when to be humorous and when to kind of hit you in the gut. So we have this moment, I heard my turtle gasp Hallelujah, which I, I can't not chuckle at every time I come across it. And I think it's just sort of perfectly placed right in there to give us a little bit of release of our tension in the midst of all of this horror and all of this kind of moral devastation. So anyway, we could we could talk all night about this poem. We could talk all night about any of these poems. I want to move on. Um and you all have, um, and yes, Chaya is making excellent points in the chat if you want to look at that. So you all have access to this document. Um, but I did want to just be clear, we're not going to read this poem right now in the interest of time, but I wanted to be clear that this is not a genre of poetry, this revising how we remember biblical narratives that is confined to men. But we looked last week at some poems by Shirley Kaufman, um, those who are here might recall um, her poem uh, in which she remembers her grandfather, um, you know, as the middleman between the landlords and the, and the peasants in Belarus. So this is a poem of hers called Job's Wife, which is thinking into that character, right? That character who kind of gets a short shrift in the text of the Tanakh. It's a worthwhile poem. I encourage you to read it um, afterwards in the source. Noah just typed the, the document in the chat. But I want to look at this poem by Roger Kamenitz, Pilpul. Anyone want to just give us like a very brief definition of this, this term, this title, Pilpul? Yeah, yeah, Al. Um, pill pull is like the uh, Talmudic back and forth between the rabbis. Exactly, exactly. This Talmudic back and forth. Um, 
we're switching gears now, I should say, from our genre of um, midrashic memory revision of Tanakh to thinking about you know, memory and modern Jewish identity. So this poem plays explicitly on a text from the Gemara, from the, from the Babylonian Talmud, which, uh, oh, I think I lost my place. Does this happen to people where like Safari just sometimes scrolls randomly? Um, anyway, um, so I'm not gonna find it here, but you can find it in the Talmud if you so choose, in Masechet Minachot, um, where there's a discussion of what happens if a boy is born with two heads? What head does he put his to fill in Shel Rosha, his, you know, his head to fill it. A, the Talmud says, begins by treating this as a hypothetical question, and then it becomes clear that it's not hypothetical. It's an interesting little sukya, an interesting little Talmudic moment. But let's look at what Roger Kamenetz does with this. Roger Kamenetz is another contemporary living poet. He's probably best known for his nonfiction book, The Jew in the Lotus, um, which some people might be familiar with about the encounter of between rabbis and the Dalai Lama. Um, interesting, worthwhile book, but he's a phenomenal poet. So he writes this poem and it goes, Rabbi, if a child is born with two heads, which head should wear the yarmulke? On which head the tefillin? Some say the right head and some say the left. All quote Torah. Some say both heads, just in case. But if a man is born with two heads, he is always confused. He never knows on which head to wear the yarmulke. Two heads and only two eyes. He walks toward himself in the old cemetery where the rabbis are buried. There seems to be some disagreement. Some are saying we are dead. Others, we are alive. Some say both, all quoting Torah. There's an odd little poem isn't it? It's, it's kind of hard to parse. But I read this poem as a kind of commentary on our modern, postmodern, whatever you want to call it, assimilated, not assimilated, semi-assimilated American Jewish identities, right? I read this poem as Cameron is saying that in some sense, we're all born with these two heads. We're all fractured, fragmented in some ways. Separate from ourselves, separate from our Jewish selves. And that given that, we have a choice to make. And it's not an easy choice. And maybe it's not even a choice at all. I don't know. Um, we have a choice to make about how to maintain our Jewish identities, our Jewish memories, how to remember the Torah that's passed down to us, given the fragmented experiences and consciousnesses and identities that we have. That's my very quick sort of read of this poem. I'm curious if anyone has uh, any other responses to this. And when I read it, I was looking at people's faces in the Zoom and a lot of people looked very puzzled, which I, which I share. Um, but to me, this is a really interesting poem about what it means to be a Jew in our modern world and what it means to have these Jewish memories that at the same time don't constitute our entire ways of being and our entire understanding of ourselves. So I'm curious if anyone has any, any responses or questions to this poem. I can say, I'll say something. Um, when he says he walks towards himself in the old cemetery, he's a modern Jew. He's walking to where the rabbis are buried. He's walking to the past. And there's a disagreement whether that tradition he's walking to is dead or still alive, right? That's, um, that, that's sort of the struggle in some sense modern Jews have is what of our tradition is still alive? Is any of it alive? Is none of it alive? Is it all alive? And you can, you know, there are these sort of two different things that you're juggling simultaneously. Yeah, I read it. I read it similarly as well. Henry, what were you going to, were you going to add something? Uh, yeah, I was just interested in the, the line, two heads and only two eyes. Uh, I, I'm, 
I don't know what it means, but it's interesting. It is interesting, isn't it? I think that as I understand it, I understand it as saying that the sort of modern assimilated Jewish consciousness, the head is split, but there's no extra vision or extra insight that comes with that, right? <laughs> you might think, oh, the trade-off we have, you know, in assimilating into American culture is that we can see better. We know more things, we understand more things. I think he's saying, no, you don't actually. <laughs> Your ability to understand, to see, to comprehend is, is just as limited as it's always been. I like that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But you know, I'm not I'm not the arbiter of correct reading. So if somebody else has a has a reading of this, um, I'd love to hear it. But to me, I think this is a poem about really, you know, what it is to be a sort of assimilated Jew grappling with this question of Jewish memory and not sure how to live with it. Um, that's that's how I understand this. But I know I will. Mm -hmm. I feel like it it's not even necessarily just assimilated Jews. Um, like I, I love the idea of like these two heads, like your Yiddish or your Gemarakov, and then like your other normal polite society head. Um, but uh in it it's not strictly modern in the sense of like the past, you know, a few decades or something, but historically there have always been conversations in religious communities about how do we represent ourselves? Like, do I wear uh, you know, as a man, like a kippa out, do I wear a full beard? Or like, do we shave? Do we wear suits? <laughs> or do we wear something that, you know, is more strongly ethnically associated with Jews? Um, and then like women also have our own conversations. I don't know, maybe Haya has some experience in this, but there's a, a very strong conversation with unmarried Jewish women who you're just walking around and like, you're not wearing anything that you know shouts i'm a jew <laughs> and the question of maybe i i would like to be more obviously jewish in certain circumstances um and that tension between like perhaps loving your jewishness and wanting to represent it um but knowing that it's not what to do in certain circumstances uh it's just not going to help anyone yeah, thank you for ex expanding the terms of this. Um, that's a great, yeah, that's a great read and a great point. Yeah, El, were you going to add something? And then, and then Judith after Yeah, El. Um, I just wanted to maybe bring up if you could talk a little bit about this idea of, you know, all quoting Torah. It feels to me that um, this person is maybe trying to to place himself in the world of Torah. Like, where do I fit in into the fabric of this memory? And he's going, like, it's, this person is going back in time to, I guess, to seek the answers. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And, you know, it's, it's striking to me in response to what you just said, right, that the image for this question comes from Gemara, comes from the heart of rabbinic literature. So it's really interesting, the metaphor for being torn between, as Noah said, on the one hand, a Gemara cope, right? A, a, a Talmudic head, if you will. And on the other hand, this kind of non-Jewish way of being, the, the metaphor for that comes from the Gemara, it comes from the Talmud. And so I, I think you're right, I see in this poem a kind of returning to the tradition, returning to the fabric of, of this Jewish memory and this lineage in order to understand how to fit into it. And in that return, realizing that it's actually not clear, that, that, that the tradition, the memory, the lineage, the inheritance, isn't going to give you the exact answer that you might be hoping for, right? Because all of these voices, these contradictory voices are quoting Torah. And so I think there's something here that says you have to figure it out for yourself. 
which is not such an easy situation to be in. Um, Judith, I don't know if that addressed what you were getting at, Yael, but that's sort of my um, my thoughts there. But you know, again, I wish we had a lot of more time for all of this. Um, yeah, Judith. Yeah, I, I may take this in a whole different direction. If you right. go back to the title, Pilpul, uh, Pilpul has a, is, as a word, has a resonance. It's a little bit denigrating, um, you know, to be saying, oh, it's Pilpul. It's, it's not serious learning. It, it's, it's unnecessarily detailed learning. And I, I love the, if you take the first stanza and the last stanza, the first stanza almost makes you kind of giggle about the silliness of this pill pull. Discussing which head to put the tefillin on is taking pill pull to the extreme and almost makes it sort of not very impressive discussion. You want to chuckle and saying that all quote Torah, to my mind, is not necessarily a positive statement. It's sort of saying, yeah, you can, you know, you can keep going with your pill and you can all be back by Torah. And there's no end to this you know, kind of conversation. And then he's doing it again in the end, but it's a much more serious and frightening and upsetting situation, but he is playing it against that first stanza of saying, maybe this is also peel pull because, you know, some say we're dead, others say we're alive. It sounds like peel pull and they all quote hurrah. He's throwing that line back at you in sort of an almost snide way. It's almost like saying, I, I don't quite have it, but, but something about this discussion he's making fun of in the way he relates it to the first stanza. And I, it doesn't make sense because it's such a serious issue. But there is something there that has the echo of Ah, yeah, that's interesting. Wow, that's such a, a rich comment. I have to, I would have to think about that more. Um, and, you know, and by the way, if you if you're intrigued by this poem, uh, Kamenetz just published just a few months ago a, a kind of career long selected poems. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in there on these similar themes about about Jewishness. Um, I want to say that was called it's called the lowercase Jew, but I might be confusing that with another collection of his. But anyway, um, yeah, in the interest of time, which we have almost none of, I want to jump down to look and close on our buddy Yehuda Amichai. Since in some ways, I actually came to the conclusion in the course of teaching and preparing for these classes that he is the great 20th century poet of Jewish memory for all of his contradictions and ambiguities. So I wanna look first at this poem of his called Tourists, which some people here might've come across before in anthologies. We're just gonna look at the end of it. We're not gonna look at the whole poem. But this poem, Tourists, it ends, right? So he's, you know, Amichai lived most of his life in Jerusalem, he was a, a, loved Jerusalem, it was one of the great topics of his poetry. And he writes, once I sat on the steps by a gate at David's tower. I placed my two heavy baskets at my side. A group of tourists was standing around their guide and I became their target marker. You see that man with the baskets? Just right of his head, there's an arch from the Roman period. Just right of his head. But he's moving, he's moving. I said to myself, redemption will come only if their guide tells them. You see that arch from the Roman period? It's not important. But next to it, left, down, and a bit, there sits a man who's bought fruit and vegetables for his family. I really like this, this moment in his poetry. It's so tender. And it combines at once the most sort of mundane um, and the most, you know, <laughs> theologically and 
cosmically significant. But I read this poem as a kind of cautionary tale for the ways that we prioritize memory. I read this as him saying, yeah, 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 you like to remember all of these cool things from the past. But if you let those things from the past that you like to remember, um, I don't know, obscure to you the reality of simple everyday human existence for people and their families, that's a big problem. It's a big theological problem, and it's a big Jewish kind of historical problem when we think about Jewish history culminating in redemption. So I'm curious if anyone else has any thoughts or responses to this or different ways of understanding it. But I, I read this as, you know, him saying, like, sometimes step back from your from your memory and look at what's around you and look at especially the people around you and the ways they care for others. Kaya. Um, so I read it in two ways. One of them was similar to what you're saying of like getting stuck in the past as opposed to I was thinking more in terms of like, you know, taking care of your family, being sort of more future thinking. But I was also thinking like I, this is informed by um, Rabbi A.J. Heschel's The Sabbath, which I just read. <laughs> but um, I'm thinking like part of the argument of that book is sort of that Jewishness is distinctive in the fact that I mean, he doesn't say this. I mean, I'm expanding on it. So don't, don't uh, no, go for it. <laughs> yeah. But um, partially because we've had to be so mobile for so long. Um, instead of having like a lot of physical monuments, like our like shrines are in sort of these like time-based, like, and I'm, this is not Heschel at all. This is me, but like tradition, like that's where Judaism lives is in the people as opposed to in buildings, um, which is kind of, kind of the opposite I think of what I was saying before because that that's saying that like the the memory itself is where is the locus because I am thinking of it in this like sort of traditional line sort of sense which does like re-emphasize um human memory and, like thinking towards the past and also towards the future um so that's that's my reaction yeah that's beautiful that's really beautiful you know Heschel said somewhere he said we don't need more Jewish textbooks we need more Jewish text people. Um, that's what you know. What you just said made me think of that. But we need people who kind of in allow these texts to inhabit them and become the locus of the text, become the locus of the memory itself. Um, but yeah, this is it's such a, a rich kind of moment. I, I really love that reading of pushing us away from physical locations for this stuff but a lot more we could say about this. Anyone, um, quick comment about this this poem? I, I mean, this is kind of piggybacking off of what Chaya said and what you said, and also a lot of things that came up over the past couple of weeks, but uh, listening to this, reading this with you, um, and also like having the setting of like people on tour and potentially taking photographs of a thing. Uh, I'm thinking of the idea of people who have an object orientation or a thing orientation versus a people orientation and how there's some, you know, judgment tied to that sometimes. Um, and we might even have some religious judgment tied to that as people who have lost our things <laughs> mm. uh, perpetually uh, and on a grand scale throughout history, um, but have also lost people. Uh, perpetually and on a grand scale throughout history and making the choice like do we want the arch or do we want someone feeding his family like when it comes down to it we choose survival of people over survival of things and that's a very I won't say it's a very Jewish thing but you know it is one thing that um, I, I feel like is uh, inherent to our religious ethic not yeah. exclusive to our religious ethic, but <laughs> yeah, beautiful. I yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Judith, uh, you know, it almost goes by you quickly, but he uses a very heavy word here. I said to myself, "Redemption will yes. only come." I mean, it's 
it's not a minor point he's he's playing with here. He's saying that redemption really requires us to shift our vision and and will only come when we're really able to see what's truly valuable in this world, which is the man who just bought his vegetables. Um, I also find it funny that I guess it's the the tourists who say, but he's moving, he's moving. Like uh, that, that's a problem. He's moving. It's, it's it's giving us a difficulty locating the arch. You know, where, whereas his moving, he's moving is really the positive aspect of being human. Um, the arch doesn't move. Yeah. This, this human being is a moving, living being, and it's bothering these people, you know, he's moving. <laughs> where, yeah. As, ah, redemption will only come when we realize this movement is what it's all about. No, beautiful. I, I, I'm glad that you brought us back to redemption because he's not just saying here, oh, it's nice, we should do this. No, the fate of the cosmos, the you know, the messianic era depends on this. The stakes of how we remember and what we remember and what we focus on could not be higher. Um, Henry, did you want to add something? Well, it's it's not at the that level of profundity, but I I just wanted to quote a line that I liked a lot, um, even though it's slightly outside what you read. Uh, and hang up their underwear to dry quickly in cool blue bathrooms. <laughs> There's something about that line I liked. It's a wonderful poem. It's a wonderful. The whole poem is worth reading. It's great. Amichai is great. Um, since we're officially out of time. Um, I want to apologize for going a few minutes over. I want to end on one very short poem. Um, if you'll bear with me, and if you need to get going, that's totally fine too. Um, from the moment I started thinking about this course, I knew that I wanted to end on this poem. It's a short poem by Yehuda Amichai. It's called Poem Without an End. So we're ending on this poem, but of course we're not actually ending. So the poem goes, Inside the brand new museum, there's an old synagogue. Inside the synagogue is me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. Inside the museum, a synagogue. Inside it, me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. <laughs> I'm gonna zoom out so we can try to see the whole thing. There we go. Um. I wanted to end on this poem because I think it's just a kind of beautiful, condensed, gem-like little way of thinking about Jewish memory, right? You might think that a museum is some external repository of history, somebody else's memories, something clinical, academic, objective. You're saying, no. I am inside the museum and the museum is inside me, right? This repository of the Jewish past is something that belongs to this, I don't know, dusty clinical place. It lives in me and simultaneously I am inside it. Jewish memory is the world that I go through and Jewish memory is a world that is contained within me. That's how I understand this poem, at least, or one of the ways I understand. It. I think it's, for how simple it is, or deceptively simple it is, it's really exceptionally rich. And I also wanted to end on this because it's a poem without an end. And I think that gestures towards something that we talked about in our little opening text today, that this chain, this lineage, this process, this experience, however you want to call it, this thing called Jewish memory that if you're here one way or another, I'm assuming you're a part of, it doesn't end, right? It doesn't stop with us. It goes on and on um, kind of infinitely forwards and backwards, just like this poem does. So with that, since we're out of time, I wanna conclude this 
session and this course. Um, but really thank you all for being a part of this. I'm really grateful. I'm grateful to Drisha for giving me the opportunity to, um, to share this and, and to have these conversations with all of you. And please don't hesitate to be in touch if you want to extend any of these questions or conversations that have come up. Um, so yeah, thanks to Noah and thanks to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Kraft, as always, for just a wonderful, wonderful course. And to everyone here for the very enthusiastic and thoughtful participation, both during and beyond the sessions. Uh, a lot of the poetry look, we looked at is incredibly deep. Um, and you know, those who are more learned uh, are finding more and more connections. And you, you keep it with you and you start remembering it differently as you explore other corners of the world and Jewish text. Um, and as always, Drisha has more classes on offer. Feel free to join in. And we hope to have all of you back learning with us, teaching with us soon. And we wish Mr. Kraft uh, lots of success Hatzlacha, with his new translation project. And we really look forward to um, uh, seeing seeing the product <laughs> and uh, perhaps having some of it shared in a future Drisha course. So thank you everyone. Please be well, have a great night. Yeah, thanks everybody. Take care.